So hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Culture Studies where we're looking at Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. So we have already covered a couple of lectures uh, on this particular text and we have covered some significant sections uh, from this text as well. So last time when we were doing this particular book, we were looking at the uh, Arendt's notion of the private realm and the public realm and how the idea of private realm was initially, was originally uh, associated with a punitive measure with someone being punished. So not appearing in the public realm was a form of punishment in ancient times. And she had observed how that kind of a notion has changed in modern era where the private actually becomes more privileged. So if you have more privacy, if you have more private space, uh, you automatically have more agency in modern times. In complete contrast to the ancient classical times where the public realm or the public presence was um, equated with prestige uh, and, uh, and a lot of agency and the private realm was uh, given to slaves, to laborers and to women. Uh, in other words, people who didn't have any agency, people who are not really citizens in the first place. So that notion has changed in modern times and that's something that Arendt has been uh, examining quite uh, interestingly. Now if you come to page 52, which should be on the screen highlighted in yellow in this uh, a particular book where she talks about how in modern times the entire uh, you know the entire agency shifts towards the private the entire idea of humanity the entire idea of individualism is dependent uh, on the design of the private space and how the private space alone can actually become a marker for agency in modern times where the grand narrative of the public space uh, is beginning to collapse um, the grand narrative of the public space or the public presence uh, is giving way uh, to micro narratives uh, and among these many micro narratives we have the narrative of the uh, the private space the home uh, the very bourgeois interior which Arendt argues uh, is something that uh, is connected with intimacy and intimacy in this sense is connected with agency so this is one of the really interesting things in this book uh, how Arendt takes of certain effects such as intimacy such as love such as pain uh, such as privacy uh, so all these sort of sentimental feelings, all these sentimental structures are given a discursive design uh, in Aaron's analysis. And it's again this idea of uh, entangling the sentimental and the discursive is something Aaron does quite uh, interestingly in this particular book, which of course ties to our original hypothesis, uh, uh, the working definition of culture that we have for this course as an entanglement uh, of the abstract and the material, as an asymmetric entanglement of the abstract and the material components. That's something that Aaron uh, underlines here, uh, especially with a reading of uh, the private space in modern times. So, and this is a, a quotation that I read out uh, from page 52, highlighted in yellow on the screen. What the public realm considers irrelevant can have such an extraordinary and infectious charm that a whole people may adopt it as a way of life, without for the reason changing its essentially private character. Modern enchantment with small things. Uh, though preached by early 20th century poetry in almost all European tongues, has found its classical presentation in the petit bonheur of the French people. So she talks about the modern obsession with small things, the modern, uh, uh, you know, entanglement, enchantment, uh, excitement with small things. And small things away obviously become the certain fires of intimacy. And uh, intimacy becomes a discursive design in modern times, according to Arendt where people uh, collect small things, people set up a design of intimacy, a design of agency in the privacy of their home uh, in complete contrast to the earlier times where the entire idea of um, agency was associated with your presence, with the palpable presence in the, in the public, place, public space. But that palpability of the public space has given way uh, to modern enchantment with small things, uh, petit bonheur, small pleasures, petit pleasures petite pleasures. So since the decay of their once great uh, and glorious public realm, the French have become masters in the art of being happy among small things, within the space of their own four walls, between chest and bed, table and chair, dog and cat and flower pot, extending to these things a care and tenderness which in a world where rapid industrialization constantly kills off the things of yesterday to produce today's objects, may even appear to be the world's last purely humane order. So, she talks about obviously an era of rapid industrialization where everything is normativized, everything is ritualized and everything is leveled away. Every difference is leveled away, every order of uniqueness is leveled away. So where can we find uniqueness, where can we find individuality, individuality? where can we find humanity which is unique in color. The only space where such uniqueness may be found according to Arendt is the private space between four walls, in the bedroom, in the drawing room, in the very private space of an individual, in very small things such as uh, a chest of tables, flower pot, cat, uh, table, dogs, etc. So again, very, very 
petite things, very small things, very micro things. So this entire idea of micro objectivity is something Arendt is foregrounding away up. And this obviously is relatable, as you can perhaps have imagined by now already. This is relatable in a very interesting sense with Lyotard's idea of micro narratives, uh, which obviously he situates against uh, the very Habermasian idea of the public space. So Arendt away up uh, is giving a commentary, she's not taking any side, she's giving a commentary on the condition of modern times, where the entire idea of the public space has dissipated essentially. And what we have instead uh, is a very the intimacy of the private realm, the intimacy of the private space, where the individual can design his, um, his individuality, his uniqueness uh, through an arrangement of, a unique arrangement of small objects, petite objects, such as tables and chairs and uh, flower pots and, uh, and, and other pieces of furniture. Okay, so, and this is obviously some kind of a resistance against industrialization, uh, which is a great leveling machine that uh, Aaron uh, describes. Uh, so industrialization is seen as uh, a leveling away of all kinds of uniqueness, a leveling away of all kinds of individuality, and as essentially a machine for mass production, a machine for mass consumption. So again, this massive mass consumption and production, where does the individual go? Where does the individual find their uniqueness, their odd charm? Uh, the individual charm and the only space which is available for them is the private space as Aaron describes it. So this, this, can be, this appears to be the world's large purely humane order as against the massive uh, industrial order on the outside. This enlargement of the private, the enchantment as it were of a whole people does not make it public does not constitute a public realm, but on the contrary, means only that a public realm has almost completely receded, so that greatness has given way to charm everywhere. For while the public realm may, uh, may be great, it cannot be charming precisely because it is unable to harbor the irrelevant. So, the ontology of the irrelevant becomes very important over here in Aaron's analysis. So, what the public realm considers or ontologizes as irrelevant uh, is that finds its home, that finds accommodation in the private space, and that becomes irrelevant in a discursive individual level, right? So, the failure of the public space, in a way, uh, is a failure to accommodate what it considers to be irrelevant. So, the public space is essentially exclusive in quality, is essentially elitist in quality, is essentially discursive in quality in a hegemonic way, and that hegemonic discursivity of the public space makes very many objects irrelevant, and those objects which are attached to individuality, attached to personal charm, those find their home in the private space, right? So, the idea of irrelevance becomes very important over here. Uh, so, that degree of irrelevance, the ontology of irrelevance over here, is a marker uh, for the very exclusive and elitist idea of the public space, which causes its demise in the long run, according to Aaron's analysis. Okay, so again, this is a very, very uh, one might argue a very postmodernist way of looking at the laws of the public space uh, as a natural cause, as a natural phenomenon. Okay, so the term public signifies the world itself in so far as is common to all of us and distinguished from our privately owned place in it. This world, however, is not identical with the earth or with nature as a limited space for the movement of men and the gen general condition of organic life. It is related rather to the human artifact. Again, we are back to the idea of the artifact. And if you remember, Aaron started this discourse by you know, mapping out three different kinds of activities uh, labor and work uh, and action. And work, of course, is the unnatural realm, the, the realm in which uh, the unnatural artifact of culture is created and manufactured and maintained. So it, it is largely an artifact. The public space is an artifact that has to be preserved. Uh, in a, but of course, that artifact is keep going away, is receding, is disappearing uh, because of its exclusive quality. Okay, and it's rather related, rather to the human artifact, uh, the fabrication of human minds, as well as to affairs which go on among those who inhabit the man-made world altogether. So, in other words, the public space is a space where uh, work and action happens. Happen. Uh, so, if, again, I'm talking about work and action in a very Hannah Arendt kind of a definition. So, work being. Uh, the construction of artificiality, the construction of uh, the artifact which is culture. And action, of course, is that activity which goes on between men, the intersubjective activity which goes on between men in that artificial apparatus, amidst that artificial apparatus, that environment which we call culture. So the public space is related to these two activities. Okay? To live together in the world means essentially to, that a world of things is between those who have it in common, uh, as a table is located between those who sit around it. 
the world, like every day in between, relates and separates men at the same time. So the world or the public space it relates men as well as separates men at the same time. So the simultaneous relate, relativity or relatedness and separation is what distinguishes the public space. But of course, the public space in modern times, according to Arendt, is losing its significance because of its uh, uh, kind of a intolerance towards what it considers to be irrelevant. Uh, so this intolerance towards irrelevance uh, pushes the public space away. And so the irrelevant, which is unique, which is human, which is charming, that finds its home, that finds its accommodation in the private space. And the enchantment of the private space is basically uh, generated out of the accommodation of the unique accommodation of the um, irrelevant in the, in, the, in the private realm. So you know this idea of the public space disappearing because it cannot accommodate the irrelevant is something that Arendt argues quite compellingly, I think. Okay, so uh, so this idea of private and public, this idea of different kinds of effect, this idea of different kinds of uh, human behavior dependent on effect, uh, is something that Arendt uh, uh, talks about quite extensively. So, if we come to this section, uh, which should be on the screen up, page fifty-eight, uh, moving on to page fifty-nine. Uh, the highlighter section in yellow, the last sentence on page 58, where she says, Under modern circumstances, this deprivation of objective relationships to others and of a reality guaranteed to them has become the mass phenomenon of loneliness, where it has assumed its most extreme and its most anti human form. So she is obviously over here examining modern loneliness and modern alienation. And what is this alienation? Is it alienation from the public space? Is it alienation between men? Is it alienation at an existential level? Or is it a very asymmetric combination of all these categories? Uh, so this is what she says uh, over here. The reason for this extremity is that Mao society not only destroys the public realm, but the private as well. Deprives men not only of the place in the world, but of the private home, where they once felt sheltered against the world, and where at any rate, even those excluded uh, from the world could find a substitute in the warmth of the herd and the limited reality of family life. So she says over here that the, the entire idea of mass society, mass production, mass consumption, mass reproduction, uh, so that, that kind of a massive scale of production and reproduction and consumption, it basically invades not just the public space but also the private space, right? And that generates loneliness. So loneliness over here becomes not just a phenomenal feeling but also a discursively designed feeling. So it's something, it's, it's a feeling which is, um, you know, caused due to certain external physical material conditions but at the same time is obviously a feeling so it's inward looking as well. So there's a degree of melancholia about the modern loneliness, the degree of melancholia in the sense that the sense of the self begins to go away, the sense of the self begins to recede away, right? Uh, uh, being constantly bombarded, being constantly invaded by the material apparatus, by the, you know, the different kind of apparatus of the mass industry which we consume around us. So. Again, we're looking at loneliness not just as an existential inward feeling, but also as an epiphenomenon, as a fallout of something which is discursive, something which is outside, something which is um, sort of physical in quality. So again, we're looking at the blurred borderline between the inside and the outside, which is something that we should keep in mind constantly when we look at culture, and not least when we're doing cultural studies. So Arendt is one of those very interesting philosophers who look at effect uh, as a discursive category. You look at effect as a phenomenon which is caused because of um, uh, a certain kind of material conditions, certain kind of discursive conditions. So effect becomes a discursive design, etc. Right? So, you know, the whole idea of effect becomes very important in Aaron's analysis and she looks at things such as intimacy, loneliness, alienation, uh, not just as existential emotional feelings, emotional categories, but also uh, categories which are equally informed by material changes, by, by discursive changes, by the you know, changes in the parameters around us. Okay, so on page 69 on your screen, again highlighted in yellow, is uh, Aaron's examination of the modern discovery of intimacy. Okay. So she says, the modern discovery of intimacy seems a flight from the whole outer world into the inner subjectivity of the individual, uh, which formerly had been sheltered and protected by the private realm. The dissolution of this realm into the social may, mo may be most conveniently be watched in the progressing transformation of immobile into mobile property, until eventually the distinction between property and wealth between the fungibles and the consumptibles of the Roman law loses all significance because every tangible, fungible thing has become an object of consumption. 
it loses private value, private use value, which is determined by its location and acquired and exclusively social value determined through its ever-changing exchangeability, whose fluctuation could itself be fixed but only temporarily by relating it to the common denominator of money. Now, this is a remarkable section over here because like most great thinkers, Aaron seems to be quite prophetic and what she's saying over here. Now, what she says over here is quite interesting. She says that under this constant bombardment of mass consumption, mass production and mass uh, reproduction, the, the borderline between private and public goes away. There's no, private, there's no public space left, but the private space equally is invaded and human being goes further inside in the, public, in the, in the private space. However, this dissolution of the realm of private and public also creates a further dissolution between what? Between uh, property and wealth, right? So the whole idea of uh, consumption becomes important over here, right? So consumption becomes all in all the, the meta category over here. So, uh, you know, the whole idea of, uh, you know, private property and wealth begins to blur away. And now what we have instead is the blurring of borderline between the fungible and the, cons and the consumptible. Uh, which was the uh, ontological difference that Romans made between what we have uh, as a permanent thing, as something that is tangible and something that will go away because you'll consume it. That kind of a distinction goes away as well because we're consuming everything. Everything is uh, consumable, in other words, in modern times, thanks to the idea, thanks to the design of the mass industry, the mass production principle. Okay, so uh, how does it happen? It happens because of the ever-changing exchangeability whose fluctuation could itself be fixed only temporarily by relating it to the common denominator of money. So let's see, let's take an example of the mobile phone today, of the smartphone today. The smartphone obviously is something that you own uh, privately, but at the same time it's used increasingly for public purposes. So you can take photos of public programs, you can make public statements on a smartphone, you can post something uh, in a social media with using a smartphone. So a smartphone becomes a very good example of what Aaron is saying over here. And again, obviously Aaron did not know a smartphone, this is way before smartphones appear anywhere in human imagination. But uh, like most great thinkers, she appears to be quite prophetic in what she's saying over here, in the sense that smartphones and many of the gadgets that we use today, uh, Bluetooth, smartphones, cards, you know, all kinds of things that we have today, they blur the borderline between the inside and the outside, between what we have as a property and what we possess as wealth, between private property and public wealth. So, you know, this entire, you know, borderline between public and private goes away because everything becomes uh, consumable, everything becomes a consumed, a consumable commodity, uh, which just has one common denominator, which is money. Okay, so again, this becomes a very important uh, argument in Aaron's analysis over here. Uh, and, you know, like, as, as I mentioned, this is one of the very prophetic things that Aaron does in, uh, in this particular book. Okay, now she comes to page 72. Uh, again, this is highlighted on yellow in your screen uh, for your visibility. And she goes on to say, only the modern age in its rebellion against society has discovered how rich and manifold the realm of the hidden can be under the conditions of intimacy. So intimacy becomes uh, almost a subversive effect in modern times, where you're constantly bombarded by uh, this mass production of things, mass consumption of things. So where do you find your individuality? Where do you find your own true self? Where do you find your own agency, which is uh, not bombarded by the material apparatus around you? The only space, the only feeling that you can go to uh, to protect and preserve and articulate your individuality is the intimate feeling, the intimate space. So intimacy becomes a very important uh, ontological condition, a very important uh, affective condition in modern times. So, you know, Arendt argues that quite convincingly. So the, the hidden conditions of intimacy, and she says it's no wonder, it's no surprise that a modern uh, French, I mean she takes example of French people over here, they're enchanted with intimacy, they're enchanted with the private space which produces and which offers them intimacy, right, as a recourse for the individual inside you, uh, as uh, a shelter against the constant bombardment of mass production and mass consumption. Okay, but you know, this obviously wasn't the case uh, in earlier times. In earlier times, the private space or the intimate space was a space inhabited by the non privileged, the laborers, the slaves, the women uh, who do not appear, who do not have access, who did not have access uh, in, the, in the public realm, in the public space, which was uh, largely uh, male, largely patriarchal, largely phallocentric. Uh, that's where political events happened, that's where political activities took place, etc. But now the private space becomes equally discursive in quality because even the private space, you can have your private effect, your private individuality. Uh, at the same time, you can also perform public functions from the private space. Uh, and that is more true to our times 
uh, than it was perhaps when Aaron was uh, originally writing this book. Okay, but she says away, oh, yeah, but it is striking that from the beginning of history to our own time, it has always been the bodily part of human existence that needed to be hidden in privacy. All things connected with the necessity of the life process itself, which prior to the modern age comprehended all activities serving the subsistence of the individual and the survival of the species. Hidden away um, were the laborers who were the bodies minister to the bodily needs of life. And the women, unsurprisingly, who were the bodies guaranteed the physical survival of the species. So we look at the two non-agentic categories, the, the two um, non-citizen categories in modern and ancient times. So the laborers, the slaves, are the women, uh, the unpaid people, the unwaged laborers, people who do not have an agency, people whose only work uh, was biological and on hidden. So in a, it was women and the slaves who were kept inside the private space, whereas the uh, privileged citizens, uh, the politicians, uh, the speakers, the rhetoricians, the statesmen, they all inhabited the public space in um, ancient classical times. So it was a very neat mapping of privilege which was operative at that time. Uh, that of course has been reversed in modern times uh, due to the uh, demise of the grand narrative of the public space as Aaron had just argued and we just saw. Okay, so women and slaves belonged uh, to the same category and were hidden away not only because they were somebody else's property but because the, their life was laborious, uh, devoted to bodily functions. So again, this is a very nice connection that one can make between Aaron's uh, opening of the human condition where she had clearly mapped out the three conditions, labor, work and action. So labor belonged to the purely biological realm, labor belonged to the uh, necessary realm which is produced, which is necessary for production of the species, for uh, preservation of the species. But it was only in work and action that culture was created and constructed and reconstructed and lived uh, at an existential political discursive level. So again, if you map out the three categories, labor obviously is where the woman and the slaves inhabit. Uh, because labor is on culture, labor is pre-culture and quality, labor is something which doesn't really come into culture at all. So culture, the hegemonic idea of culture, the dominant idea of culture, according to Aaron, does not take labor into account. Labor is something which happens elsewhere, hidden away at a subterranean level, at uh, a subliminal level sometimes, uh, not visible, uh, spectacularly uh, invisible. Uh, and therein lies, th that's why uh, non-citizens such as women and slaves inhabit, lie. They don't appear in the public realm because the public realm is an exclusive realm, uh, is an agentic realm, is an agentic space where activities and work take place and where culture is formed, reformed and um, sort of uh, protected. Uh, so that, again, we're looking at culture, uh, looking at it from a sort of ancient classical perspective as a very exclusive activity, as an activity which is uh, not really uh, all-inclusive, but of course it's very exclusive and very elitist in, in quality as well. So culture is protected and maintained and created by a handful of men who are the privileged citizens, whereas labor, the biological labor, the manual labor, the non-cultural labor takes place in the private space. That, that's how the mapping happened uh, in ancient times, which is obviously the way, you know, that's changed now uh, because of the idea of the, um, the public space going, dying a natural death. Right? So the idea of the public space going away, the idea of the unified public space disappearing, and then so we have different micro spaces, which are the intimate spaces of home, is something that Arendt argues quite convincingly, describes quite convincingly. And again, one can relate this to uh, Lyotard's contention, Lyotard's argument against Habermas, uh, by looking at the micro narratives of uh, uh, the intimacy, uh, and the privacy, etc., which are obviously situated against um, in resistance to the meta narrative of the uh, um, the grand narrative of the public space. Okay, so uh, now we move on to uh, the next section where Aaron talks about uh, she's sort of critiquing Marx away, uh, and this is a section where uh, you know she she talks about how the Marxian analysis, the Marxist analysis of labor and activity and culture needs to be revised in modern times. Uh, we can't just draw on blindly from Marx, and that's something that she argues quite interestingly in the section called Labor in this book. And again, we're looking at, uh, among the many things which this book does, is it offers a revision of Marxism, and it, it gives a, so a recontextualized analysis of Marxism, and it sort of rescues Marxism, in my view, from being a grand narrative, and looks at Marxism as a micro-narrative, which needs to be 
re-looked at and relocated in the micro conditions of modern times rather than looking at Marxism as some kind of a meta discursive uh, uh, formula that can be applied anywhere without any respect to the context. Okay? So, uh, like most postmodern philosophers, like most philosophers who anticipate postmodernism in a healthy way, uh, Arendt is very suspicious of a non contextual understanding of Marxism, uh, a meta discursive understanding of Marxism. And instead, she redirects attention to the micro narratives that Marxism can relate to uh, in terms of looking at the different configurations of labor, work and action in modern times. Okay, so when it comes to work, because work is the cultural activity that Aaron uh, describes, work is the artificial activity which creates the artifact which we call culture. And when it comes to work and relationship between work and the spaces over here, she argues quite convincingly that how culture is created no longer not just in a public space but also in a different micro activities which takes place in the intimate spaces. So intimacy also becomes a cultural phenomenon, intimacy becomes uh, a very interesting, subversive phenomenon in Aaron's contention. Okay, so all these categories are very important to look at, uh, and you know, again, we're looking at the blurred borderlines between effect and discourse, between discursivity and corporeality, between embodiment. Uh, we're looking at embodiment really as a discursive condition as well as an effective existential condition as well. Okay, so this basically brings us uh, towards the end of Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition, which is a very complex text. But among the many things which it does, uh, it gives a very fresh idea, especially given the time in which it was written, it gives a very fresh idea to the idea, to the understanding of culture. Culture is an artificial activity, culture is a discursive activity, culture is a discursive design, uh, which takes place uh, through work and action, uh, and how culture is not always an inclusive activity. It can oftentimes become an exclusive activity especially when it comes to uh, the, the patriarchal component of culture, the racial component of culture, uh, the phallocentric component of culture. And this is what makes Aaron such a, uh, such a complex philosopher uh, in our times today because lots of people draw on Aaron today, lots of different kinds of thinkers draw on Aaron today. We have the feminists who draw on Aaron quite clearly, the postmodernists who draw on her quite clearly, uh, the post-humanist scholars draw on her quite clearly, and Aaron remains, I think, uh, one, of the, one of the classical thinkers of her times, uh, chiefly because of a very complex definition of culture that she offers to us uh, as students of cultural studies. So, this concludes this particular text, Hannah Arendt's uh, The Human Condition. I hope you find this interesting and complex enough, to, so especially in relation to our codes. And I request you to go back and revisit the sections that we looked at in close details. And we'll obviously carry on interaction in this course. We'll move on to the next text in the next lecture. Okay, thank you for your attention.